Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, I'll start it yeah. all over again. Welcome to today's session on the book of Exodus, this, which is the second book in the Old Testament. Before we could start, can one of us say a word of prayer, please? Sid, can you lead us in prayer? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. For Almighty Father God, we come to the throne of grace. We thank you for giving us this time in the in the time we will learn about Exodus and all the Bible and the Old Testament, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that you have given us this opportunity that we are going to learn from your word. We are going to learn the scriptures, the Torah, the Pentateuch, Lord, you have given us. We are, Lord, as we learn from your word, Lord, please give us the wisdom and enlighten us with your word so that we can learn and our future generation which, are, which is going to serve you, Lord. We might be like the tools you to be used for your kingdom, Lord. All your guidance, Lord, we need your guidance, Lord. We need your we need the garden of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Whatever yes. we learn, let, let we should put in the practice, Lord, and you should love us, Lord. Let us set an example for the yes. fellow countrymen oh lord let all we learn in this in this chapter lord all we learn in this bible school lord let us we tell let us keep it in the like the tablet in our heart lord you have said in yes. Proverbs seven, lord whatever the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge lord we need your wisdom lord we need your knowledge lord we have to fear lord so that you can give us wisdom lord whatever we learn here lord let us be kept in our heart lord in jesus name we pray amen 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 Thank you, Sid. Thank you for leading us in prayer. Uh, well, before we could start the class, I'll just project the uh, screen to us, the notes. Everyone can see this, the second chapter on our notes on the book of Exodus. Can everyone see? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, Thank you for the confirmation. So the time that passes between the last verse of the Genesis and the first verse of Exodus is about 400 years. Then the 70 people we saw in the last class, the 70 people who moved from Egypt, who moved to Egypt in an effort to survive through the great famine had now multiplied into two or three million people. And seeing that the Israelites abundantly multiplied and exceedingly mighty, the new king who did not know Joseph was terrified and inflicted them with heavy burdens in order to build new cities. So with this as the background, we will just see what our notes says before we could study in depth background of the book of Exodus. On the right side of our notes, we see that there's a chart which talks about the focus the redemption from egypt and the revelation from god we see the references given from chapter 1 to chapter 40 which talks about the need for redemption and how they prepared for the redemption and how god redeems israel and then how he preserves the Israel and how he forms it as a nation and he establishes a covenant with them. And lastly, in uh, you know uh, chapter 32 to 40, we see the response of Israel to God's covenant. With that, we come to the author. So do we know who's the author of this book? Moses. Great, thank you. So this Moses. book, yes. Thanks. Good. Uh, yes. So the uh, the date and the location of this book, which was written, is uh, you know the date they say approximate date. Okay, they are not exact, but they approximate in one thousand four forty six BC. Uh, this was written by Moses, and we also see the very purpose of this book. 
uh, to continue the history of Israel began in Genesis and uh, it reveals the personal, relational and the covenant making nature of God and we also see God's concern for and power to rescue his people and we see how God provides moral social and spiritual laws for Israel and we also see the three unique features in this book the events of Exodus marks as Israel's birth as a nation and it marks the beginning of Israel's tabernacle and the yearly festivals and we also see one of the major event as the crossing the miraculous or the supernatural crossing of crossing of the Red Sea and uh, then we come across in our notes the comparison of the book of Exodus with the other books and they compare here with the book of Leviticus which we can go through it and uh, below we come to the outline before we could uh, go through the outline I would like to uh, share about the background share about what is this book of Exodus reveals to us and after that we will study on the key points or the key events from this book that we could learn, that we could take it from this book. So we see uh, the background of this book is uh, the more the Egyptians, uh, when we see uh, the Israelites multiplied many in number in this Egypt and uh, here there's a race of uh, Pharaoh who did not know about Joseph and he, he's been terrified and inflicted by these people, uh, you know, uh, by these uh, people growing large in number. So he wants to, uh, you know, burden them, uh, burden them in order to build new cities and the more the Egyptians uh, burdened Israelites the more they grew and multiplied uh, making things worse the Israelites were made to work as slaves in Egypt and this is how God calls Moses through the burning bush and we see uh, in Exodus records a story of how God supernaturally delivers his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt and how God leads his people to Mount Sinai and gives them the Ten Commandments. We also see how God teaches them to worship and serve him eventually formed them into a nation governed by his law began leading to the promise uh, promised land of Cana we see Moses being the only recorded eyewitness to all these events of Exodus uh, he writes this book around we saw that in 1446 BC and he wrote this book to continue the history of Israel that began in Genesis to show God's concern and the power to rescue his people and to provide moral, social and spiritual laws for Israel. The events of Exodus just didn't mark the Israel's birth as a nation, but also marks the beginning of Israel's tabernacle and yearly festivals. Uh, we see that Exodus also shows how God got his people out of Egypt, whereas Leviticus shows us how we try to get Egypt out of his people. So let's look at the key events. Let's look at the key events or the key chapters, talk, the events that occurred in the Exodus that we, that you and I should remember. So I will just uh, project or I will just share my screen on the 10 key events that we would we can discuss today. These are the 10 key events that we would like to look into today. The first is in Exodus chapter 3, 1 to 12, we see the call of Moses through the burning bush. Anyone wondered how God called Moses? God's story of his people Israel goes all the way back to his call, the call of Abraham. And his promise that he will make him a great nation and lead his descendants into the promised land. And we find that and we find that, uh, you know, how God is trying to keep that promise with Israel. 
though they have been struggling in Egypt, they have been oppressed as slave laborers to Pharaoh. And, uh, and these Israelites cry out to the Lord and God hears their cry. So what happened to God's promise? Had it been forgotten at the outset of the story of the Moses call of God? God remembers his promise with Israel. And here God calls Moses through the burning bush. And he introduces himself to Moses saying that I am the God, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And right now Moses is about 80 years old, advanced in his age at this time when God called him. But when God asked Moses to be the leader to bring the Hebrews out of the captive, he cried out saying to the Lord saying, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was not the impetuous person he had been 40 years before when he had tried to help his own people by his own strength and happened to kill an Egyptian and he had to flee from Egypt to Median. Now he was humbled so that he had to lean upon the Lord Though initially he didn't agree, but later he accepted the call of God. And God said, certainly, I will be with you. God assures, affirms Moses that he will be with him. And the same assurance, the same affirmation God is doing with each of us today. When he has called us, just like Moses, he has called us, he has set us apart. And if God can say Moses that he will be with him, surely, certainly, the same God is calling you and me. And he's affirming us that he will be with us. And friends, if God is with us, who can be against us? Now back to Moses. Moses was afraid to go back to the children of Israel because he did not think they would listen to him. But God gave him authority. God not only calls us, but he also gives us the strength, the authority. God told him to tell the people that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had sent him. The Jewish people, even till this time or even to the time of Jesus, honored their father Abraham very highly. So if the God of Abraham was speaking to them, they should listen. God told Moses everything that he should say to his people. And so he does to each of us as his true ministers. The spirit of the God who abides with us teaches us in the same way as he taught Moses. Moses was a simple man when God called him. He was so much dependent on God the man uh, where the Bible records that he was an orator and the same person looks at God and says, I cannot speak well. And here God gives him an assistant, but God encourages him to speak. The same way God is looking at each one of us and he is encouraging us to take up his call and speak because the scripture says that God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. When God has set us, when God has called us and set us apart, he prepares us. The scripture also says that you don't have to worry about what you have to say. For I am the God who puts his word into our mouth and speaks to people. Because he is a God who knows the needs of people. He knows the situation, the circumstance, what each of us are in. And he speaks exactly to each one in the way that they can understand. So we need to depend on God as we accept his call. He gives us the authority and he leads us. All we need to do is, just like Moses, lean on God. 
so that he can do great and mighty things in and through us because that's what the scripture says that you shall do greater things than what I do this is what Jesus said with this we will move on to the second point the ten plagues we see that in Exodus chapter 7 verse 14 to 12 14 to chapter 12 till verse 30 as the Passover uh, tells it after Pharaoh refuses Moses uh, you know there were a lot of plagues there were 10 plagues that God sent to rescue the people of Israel from Egypt because Pharaoh's heart was hardened he refused to let the Israelites go from Egypt so God sends the series of 10 plagues to pressure the Egyptian ruler Pharaoh each time Pharaoh promises to free the Israelites but he reverses his decision when plague is lifted until the last one the ten plagues are the water turning to blood frogs and he released lies flies livestock pestilence there were boils on people, hails and uh, locusts and uh, you know locusts eating up everything, the crop and filling up all the places and there was darkness for three days and still the Pharaoh heart was hardened and he never let them go. Yes, the first seven plagues, he was in control and he his heart, he made his heart harden and he decided not to go. But later part, we see how God hardens Pharaoh's heart. What we learn from this situation is a uh, God is a, is a, uh, he has control of everyone. God controlled Pharaoh's heart as well. Now the last plague when it uh, when it was afflicted the killing of the firstborn of children this moved Pharaoh Pharaoh said uh, to Moses like immediately take your people and go away from you and he let them go even when Israel uh, uh, even when Moses journeyed his people and uh, uh, they reached the Red Sea the De uh, Red Sea Pharaoh's heart changed again he chased them and he came there with his army but then we will unfold the story, story much later what happens but here we see the plagues which are recorded in the book of Exodus are the demonstration of God's power over not only on Pharaoh but also over the gods of Egypt so the ten plagues that was that afflicted the Egypt where the ten gods which Egypt uh, the Egyptian worshipped and God overpowered them with this we will move on to the third point the exodus in exodus chapter 12 verse 31 to 42 we see the exodus the liberation of people of israel from slavery in egypt the 13th century we see that the leadership of uh, uh, i mean how moses leadership moved people and how we uh, minister to them in an organized manner and how God taught him how God instructed Moses to lead the people of Israel and he led them with freedom with this we will move on to the fourth point Passover we see that in chapter 12 the heartless Pharaoh still refused to free the Israelite slaves so God brought one last plague the last plague was the firstborn to be died which was so terrible that it was certain to uh, persuade Pharaoh to let his slaves go that night God sent the angel of death to kill the firstborn sons of Egyptians and God told Moses to order the Israelites family to sacrifice a lamb which is a uh, which is spotless and smear the blood on the door of the lamppost in in this way the 
angel of death would know to pass over the house of the Israelites. And this is why the festival commemorating the escape from the Egypt is known as Passover. And they still celebrate among the Jewish people. With this, we will move on to the fifth point, the Red Sea crossing. We read this in Exodus chapter 14. As the Israelites had left, Pharaoh changed his mind. He called his army and set off to pursue the Israelites on chariots. The Israelites is in, are in great fear. They cried out to Moses and they said, it would have been better for us to stay than to die in the wilderness. And we look at Moses being the leader. He looks up to God and asks God, what should I do now? And God ordered Moses to stretch out a staff over the Red Sea, and the sea parted. This allowed the Israelites to escape through the sea and away from Egypt unarmed. Just like Moses, just like the Israelites, even we uh, face a lot of obstacles in our life. We see there's no other way, just like how the Red Sea was before them, letting them no way. Even we have faced many circumstances, or we may be in midst of this situation where there's no way. And God is reminding us today, look up to him. When we look up to him, God gives us a solution. He makes a way where there's no way. The God who made a way for Israelites through Moses, he will certainly make a way for you and me. As, as the Israelites were passing through the way that, uh, 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 passing through the Red Sea, which was parted, we see Pharaoh's army following them and charging them into the sea. And Moses looks up to the Lord and then he waves his staff and the sea returned back to its normal height, swallowing all the entire army of Pharaoh. And the story of escape from Egypt commemorates the Jewish people every year during the festival of Passover. They read the story to their children to remember how God freed Israel from the slavery of Egypt. So in this way, they keep the idea of being freedom is kept alive and it's continuous, uh, continuously passed on to the generation to generation. With this, we will move on to the sixth point Exodus, uh, sixth point, which talks about the bread from the heaven. Exodus 16. Not only after the Jewish people had escaped Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, they ran out of the food they had brought with them. They began to grumble, recall the tasty meals they had enjoyed when they were slaves, And Moses was facing difficult time with these people in the wilderness. And he looks up to God for each and every situation that he came across, the difficult situation he came across by leading these people. He looked up to God for the solution. And God told Moses that he would rain down the bread from heaven for the people. And that evening, uh, bread and meat from the heaven to the people. And that evening, we see the quail came and covered the camp. And people killed the birds and ate their meat. And the next morning, we see the dew evaporated. A white substance covered the ground. The Bible describes the substance as manna. Uh, as a fine flaky substance, white like coriander seed and tasting like wafer made with honey. Moses instructed the people to gather and uh, as much as needed in two parts for each person each day. When some of people tried to save extra, that extra uh, part which was remained was wormy and it got spoiled. So this way, God was teaching 
people that he is a provider for each and every day and depend on God. Don't worry about tomorrow because I am the Lord, your provider. I provide you. I meet your needs. So God was teaching people to take what is required. And manna appeared for six days in a row. <clears throat> on Friday, the Hebrew way to gather a double the portion on Fridays. The Hebrews were instructed to gather double the portion because it did not appear on the next day, the Sabbath. And yet the portion they saved for Sabbath did not spoil because that was the instruction that God gave them. Manna was a supernatural food that God gave to the Israelites during this 40 years wandering in the desert. So what does this word manna mean in Hebrew? Can any of us tell? You can unmute and speak. What is What is manna means in Hebrew? Because they're talking, it means, what is this? Man, maybe the food of angels? Yes. Okay. Uh, Elisha, I understand that you all have been posting the questions. Can we uh, make a note of these questions so that at the end, during the discussion, uh, we can answer these questions so that we will not miss on the flow of the class. Is that okay? If I could answer your question at the end of the session? Okay, madam. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. So class, if you all have any questions, please make a note. We can have the time of discussion at the end of 10 minutes of the class. Okay, so back to the class. So what is manna means? Yes, the angels food. Thank you, Sid. The bread of heaven, or some say corn of heaven, and it's a and also the uh, the quails that was provided was the spiritual meat that God gave His children in the wilderness. With this, we will move on to the seventh point, Jethro's advice. Who was Jethro? Class, Jethro? Moses' father-in-law. Exactly. Thank you. Good. So we see Jethro's advice in Exodus chapter 18. One of the most, um, you know, uh, advice that we could learn from this. Now, Moses, who had grown in the palace of Egypt, and Moses knew how to govern his people and how, how could one person govern an entire nation, there the challenge was. So Moses' father-in-law visited, uh, uh, visited Moses during this time. And uh, uh, Moses' father-in-law was Jethro, and he was a priest in his own community, knew that, uh, knew that uh, Moses been ministering to his people would be a great task because he saw people standing in a queue from morning till evening. So Jethro introduced Moses to select capable men from among all the people who are. Uh, look at the qualities that Jethro recommends Moses to select with to choose the men with. The men who fear God was his first point. Men who fear God. The second, he says, look out for trustworthy people. And then the third, he says, who hates dishonest gain. The men who hate dishonest gain. And such men, you appoint them as officers over thousand, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. And let them sit as judges over the people at all times. And let them bring very important cases to you, but decide very, uh, but uh, they themselves decide very minor cases by themselves. So it will 
be easier for Moses uh, to bear the burden. If not, it will burn him out on a longer period. So this was a very valuable suggestion that uh, Jethro gives Moses and Moses receives his, receives it with all humility. So what are the three? Can we summarize these three points that we could learn from Jethro's advice to Moses? The first point was to teach others. As a minister, as a ministry leader, we need to uh, we need to have the ability to teach others. The second point we learn from his advice is that appoint others as officials over the people, so that will lessen our burden. And the third advice that we could learn is uh, take only uh, only the most difficult cases which only you can handle and rest you encourage or teach your officers or teach your ministry leaders to handle themselves so these are the three points that we can learn from from the advice of jethro with this we will move on to point eight the ten commandments which has been recorded in exodus 20 chapter 1 to 17. Is Ten Commandments needed? Do we still need them? What does Ten Commandments denotes to us? Anyone in the class can answer? They show us who God is. The law is an expression of the lawgiver's heart and character. We must think about that before we say, I don't care for the law, or that was given in the olden days uh, for the Israelites and not for us. The commandments not only show us what God wants us to do, but they also show us what God is like. They say something that, his honor, his worth, his majesty. They tell us what matters to God. And we can't disdain the law without disrespecting the lawgiver. These laws set us apart from the worldly things. As Christians, we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We must be prepared to stand alone, to look different, and to have rules uh, the world doesn't understand. Of course, we aren't always the holy people as what we should be, but that's what he has called us to be. We need to strive to that. It's not a difficult task. The Lord has blessed us. The Lord has put his Holy Spirit within us who will always teach us, lead us and guide us towards the pathway of what God wants us to be in. That's how we are. That's how we should be. We are his people. God has chosen us just the way he has chosen Moses. He has set us apart to live according to God's way. They uh, so that means that these commandments or these laws do not strip us from our freedom, but instead it provides us. We too often think of the Ten Commandments as constraining us as if God's way will keep us in servitude and form realization our dream and reaching our potential. We forget that God means to give us abundant life. We see in John 10, 10, which says, I give you life in abundance. And in John 8, 32, we see God saying that I give you the true freedom. I'm not here to take away the freedom, but to give you the true freedom. So in John 3, uh, John chapter 5, verse 3 tells us, his laws are not burdensome. So with this, we need to abide by the law, the, the command, what God has uh, asked us to keep. In the New Testament, we see the two commandments. What are they? 
Jesus gives us. Can anyone unmute and speak? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you, Elisha. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is what we need to be. This should be a Christ likeness in us. With this, we will move on to the next point. Point nine. The worship of the golden calf. We see in chap Exodus chapter 32. As a reward for a service, we see Aaron has been appointed. When uh, I mean Aaron, Aaron has been appointed to take care of people as uh, Moses went on the Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. When uh, and uh, uh, and the Israelites who were down waiting for Moses to come, they grew impatient, and it was very hard time for Aaron to manage them. So according to Exodus, we see that, you know, uh, they, uh, the Israelites gathered around Aaron and, and asked him to come up with the God who, who, shall, who shall go before them. We see that in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. They demand Aaron saying that, come, make us a God for us who shall go before us rather than remaining steadfast in faith and uh, waiting for Moses to come, Aaron gives in to their pressure. So he orders the people to collect the gold and uh, in their possession and used it to create a golden calf for worship. So whatever they see or they did in Egypt, they tried doing it here. Golden calf was one of the god that the Egyptians worshipped. And we see, um, you know, when Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two stone tablets, when he saw the very sight of, the, of that golden calf, he fumed with anger. He was so angry that he threw the uh, stone tablets on that golden calf and he ordered 3,000 males to be put to death. Moses had to ascend Mount Sinai again to get the stone tablet, the commandment again written by God once more. With this, we will move on to the 10th point, the last point. The shining face of Moses, we see in Exodus 34, verse 29 to 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand, and he came down from the mountain. And as uh, Moses came down and the Israelites looked up to him face to face, and they noticed a shine, a supernatural shine from his face, his skin was shining. And the Israelites, and including Aaron, could not see Moses face to face. So when, uh, when Moses uh, shared the Ten Commandments with the people, and after that he had to cover his face with the veil, so that, uh, you know, uh, because people could not look at him and talk. So he had to, um, he had to put a veil to cover his face. With this, we end these 10 events that we would uh, like to share. Share with the class. We see the shadow of Christ in this book as the Passover lamp. That Jesus is the Passover lamp for us right now. And it was a shadow which happened in the Old Testament in the book of Egypt. With this, we will also have an assignment. I will share the assignment with you all. Give me a minute as I share the assignment with you all.
we have two assignments. OK, please note down these questions. I will also post it for you on the chat. The first question is, what are some leadership lessons we learn from the life of Moses from this book? And the second one is, what are the Ten Commandments relevant for us today? How are the Ten Commandments relevant for us today? These are the two questions. You all can prepare your assignment. And for Genesis, I'll give it to you all next week in the next class. So let's go into a time of discussion. I've shared the question in the chat. So those who are still writing can see the question from the chat, and you all can complete the question. OK, Elisha said, would God harden a person's heart and to salvation? Anyone in the class would like to answer Elisha's question? Mm, I would love to answer, but yes, Jeffina. I, I just want—I don't know the reason, but I just want to say that I don't think God will harden some hearts into salvation. I just believe it—it it must be the character of Pharaoh. Like he don't want to let go of the Egyptians, so God just took a step and hardened his heart so that he don't do that. And it's written in the Bible that I want to do a lot of miraculous things, so I harden his heart. So I believe that could be one of the reasons. Like God want to do some great things in the in that place, so that He want to show that I'm here to do things for you. I will save you, and that's why He hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And uh, I believe there must be some reasons, like why God chose Pharaoh to harden hearts. He could have chose someone else, but He chose Pharaoh. I believe there must be some reason. But I don't believe that God will heart. Uh, harden someone's heart from salvation because God is very close to the broken hearted and he really came to set us free and give us salvation. So my answer for the question is no. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Can I say something? Colin? Yes, please. Yeah. I would like to agree with the Jafina, but at the same time disagree with her, because as the Bible says uh, in Exodus, that God hardened the, the heart of Pharaoh. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that we can now disagree with what the Lord himself is saying. I think at times he can do his own will and does it for, for as a way of preaching the gospel to others, as a way of teaching others the lessons. Because I even remember when his son, Jesus Christ, was here, he said that, God knows, uh, God gives me my sheep. I know my sheep. That means that there are those, there are so many sheep, but there are some which are his and some which are not his. But I, uh, it's, not, it's not up to me to judge, but I think it is true. God can harden somebody's heart. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? We see what the scripture says. The scripture says what we learn from this situation is that God is in control of everything. Through the 10 plague, we see that God was in control of the nature, the weather, the things around, everything, including the human's heart. Yes, we see that Pharaoh was stubborn initial of the days and his heart was hardened but then God has control over the man as well he chooses he can make he can make a person's heart hard and also he can make it soft the word of god says in john i'll just put the scripture john uh, chapter 6 verse 44 
John chapter 6, 44. It says, no one can come. Did you all get that in the chat? Yeah, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last days. So when we talk about the salvation, when we talk about reaching out to people, there is a time and there is a season how God prepares a man and he calls him. And only then he can repent and come. No matter how hard he can make his heart hard, towards not receiving Jesus as a Lord and Savior. But then God chooses to call people. God chooses, God chooses to strike his heart, make his heart soft, or make his heart hard. That's why we need to pray for the unsaved loved ones. That's why God asks us to minister to them. The word has the power, the word has the power to penetrate a person's heart and transform that heart, lead them to God. So the Lord chooses whom we should. But we have to do our work, our part, because that is what in the Great Commission God has, Jesus has given to each one of us to go share the gospel to the utmost part of the world. And God prepares people's heart. Despite the challenges, despite what they are, God encounters them in a supernatural way. He decides. We also see Divya has posted a verse. This is from which book? Uh, as it's Hebrews 3, 7 to 11. <clears throat> Can you read Divya? Uh, yeah, so it talks about uh, uh, warning against unbelief. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with the generation. I said their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my way. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Uh, yeah, and also we see, I think in Romans, like uh, people, they are giving into immorality and God is just, uh, you know, allowing them to do it because they are not understanding even though the nature shows the existence of god yeah still people do not understand yeah so god just gives them into their fleshly desires so i yeah the bible speaks about that as well yeah yes. thank you davia thank you Lasha, did that answer your question yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you divya I think you have brought a lot of clarification on the issue. Thank you. OK. OK, as time is up, we can uh, end the session with a word of prayer before we could go uh, with the other questions. And I would encourage everyone to please post your questions. And we can discuss this in the 10 minutes of the next class. OK, so I see John Paul has posted three questions. And also, Jafina. Uh, OK, Jafina's question was to do with regard to the assignment. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah, Isaac has got a question. We can discuss on this much later uh, as uh, as we go ahead with our course. OK, but we will keep a note of these questions and we can discuss in the class because these questions will benefit all of us. OK, so today as the time is up, let's end this class with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you. We praise you for who you are in midst of us. You are a God, our Lord, who leads us, who guides us, who has delivered us from every affliction. You are a God who sees us, who hears our voice, hears our cry time and again, and you are leading us. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that you have given us. 
thank you for the liberty in our life oh lord from every situation every circumstance that we go through because your word says that we are more than overcomer thank you lord that you are a god you have set us apart and you are preparing us as your holy people uh, as your, as your priest lord thank you for every promise that you have have revealed to us personally to each one of us and you have called us and as per your promise lord that you will never leave us nor forsake us but you will be with us you will lead us you are the god of abraham isaac and jacob and you are the god of us thank you for who you are in our life lord that you are the same god who said to moses tell the israelites i am who i am and you are the same god who is with us the same i am thank you lord you are a god our promise keeper we love you we honor you we respect you we surrender ourselves to you we pray that you will help us to do everything that pleases you in our life lord thank you father thank you for everything thank you for your faithfulness in our life in jesus name we pray amen amen amen, amen. thank you so amen. much for thank you ma'am Thank you so much for joining in today's session. We will study on the next book, Leviticus, in the next class. Please come to the class prepared. Go through your notes. Go through every scripture in the Bible, every events, the main events, so that we can discuss in the class. Thank you. God bless. Ma'am, when you, ma we have to submit the assignment?